final and very interesting question of this batch. And this is from Todd Torkelson. What is the difference, he asks, between a chronicler and an historian? Are chronicles, he continues, ever contest are chronicles, let's repeat that, are chronicles ever considered historically reliable sources? Well, let's reduce it to difference between a chronicle and a history. The term chronicle ultimately comes from the Greek chronos for time. It is simply a kind of record of events. The record of events in the life of a country, in the life of a monastery, in the life of a town. In other words, it's a kind of, if you like, almost a diary, a list. This year that happened. The following year, the other thing happened. There was a great flood. There was um, a, a nasty plague. Um, the king died. Uh, the king married. Uh, the the, um, the 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 Lord Mayor died of the plague. That sort of thing. It is essentially a list of chronological facts as they happened, with usually not much ex attempt much attempt if any, at explanation. It's, 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 it's a bit like an engagement diary. We did this thing, did this thing, did this thing, did this thing. History, uh, again, ultimately coming from the Greek, um, uh, where it means kind of expert, uh, um, 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 I don't have Greek. I, I'm afraid I'm reflecting the learning of the Oxford English Dictionary. And it's then turned into uh, the, the history then becomes the creation of a narrative, um, a coordinated systematic narrative of the past, which of course entails the study of character and entails historical explanation. So one is the list of the chronicle, is the list of events. The history is the, of course, the recital of events, but the attempted explanation of events as well. Roughly speaking. Now, this is related to the other question, which is the reliability of them. Now, here, traditionally, of course, there is much sneering at chroniclers, especially because in the Middle Ages they tended to be monastic and the monasteries, by the time of the Renaissance, have got an extremely bad name. And there's also the general tendency of modern historians to sneer at anything that is not this systematic, reasoned, explanatory, often even philosophical narrative that since the 18th century has been the historical fashion. Therefore, the second question, the, day, the second question that Todd asks, are chronicles ever considered historically reliable sources? You see the presumption of the question. There is this bad old thing called the chronicle, which is terribly infradig and we don't take seriously. And there's this bright, shiny, new, modern thing, well, either belongs to the ancient world or to the revival uh, of the ancient world with the Renaissance and the, uh, and the Enlightenment and so on, which is you know, a good, important um, uh, 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 um, and significant. It's very similar, actually, to the denigration in the modern teaching of history of factual knowledge. You know, who cares about fact? You can look it up on Wikipedia. All you want are skills, analytical skills. That's a subject of another uh, another disquisition and I'm afraid not very temperate video. Uh, how on earth can you think about something if you actually don't have the facts at your fingertips? The reason that I can do these things is because I remember, because I have the information and therefore and only because I've got the information I can organise it, I can analyse it, I can reach for examples across periods of time, I can show how things connect and how one thing becomes the other. But to go back to the point, what you're presuming, Todd, is that there is 
a good source, there are sources that are good and that the historian, as it were, recognises as reliable. The history, and there are bad things called chronicles, which the historian is doubtful about. See, I, this was the approach to history of my own great teacher, of Geoffrey Elton. Geoffrey, um, in one famous article, categorised sources in terms of their intrinsic liability. He puts at the very top uh, things like administrative documents and so on, and at the very bottom he puts things like diplomatic reports, uh, which he sees as being inherently flawed. Actually, of course, I was able to demonstrate that very often administrative documents contain utterly deliberate lies. Um, the <laughs> partly because of convention uh, and partly uh, um, um, and partly because of the, uh, the 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 way in which administrative structures have developed so the in the medieval exchequer for example um what are royal debts um uh, appear as though they were actually payments um this is done through the manipulation of tallies and so on uh, in other words unless you really understand the the fact that the accounts are employing private languages um, which is a little note in the margin um a, 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 a tally pro or a tally sol a tally sol is one there's bit solutus is where there's been a real transaction the tally pro is this fictional tally which actually describes which which actually you Actually describes a royal debt and so on. Um, uh, so administrative records can be very treacherous too uh, and I would argue diplomatic records if you've got a clever and intelligent ambassador can be pretty reliable but in other words there is no category of source, chronicle, diplomatic account, um, government document, committee minute, history which is reliable and to be taken for granted. And there's no category which is unreliable and to be dismissed. All historical evidence, in Starkey's view, is born free and equal. It has to be subject to the test. The, no evidence has intrinsic authority. It has to be tested against other evidence, against plausibility, against the values of the time, and so on and so on. And the irony is, I would say, therefore, that very often the bare chronicle, because it is without aspirations to uh, explanation, it is merely statement of this happened and that happened, is very often very good historical evidence. Whereas the sophisticated history in which especially the contemporary historian imports his own values, his own party affiliations, his own preferences, his own loves and hatreds, you know, things like um, Clarendon's account of the Civil War and so on, the, 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 the great Roman histories and so on, uh, Thomas More's history of Richard III. Um, these are very often profoundly suspect documents precisely because they have so much of the historian and his generally is his his specific views in them therefore they need serious they don't need dismissing i mean on the contrary and um, i by and large accept i mean we're talking about thomas moore i by and large accept uh, moore's account um but but you need to apply exactly the same critical text tests to them however elegant and sophisticated they are and then finally there's an example that is really the most beautiful illustration of the difference between let's go back to the to the, the first question uh, the, the the that illustrates most beautifully the difference between chronicle and history and that is the Croyland chronicle the the, the Fenland chronicle um, which has got this extraordinary continuation uh, which is done by somebody we don't know, but is clearly a highly sophisticated, uh, uh, very skillful Latinist, profoundly aware of the inner circles of politics, of the 
uh, of the end of uh, Edward IV's reign, the usurpation and reign of Richard III, and the triumph of Henry VII at Bosworth. And the surrounding chronicle is exactly what we describe. And it's actually rather a bad example. Right? All to do with the, the doings of the Abbey of Croyland, of, of fusses about uh, uh, internal disputes within the Abbey, uh, fusses about waterways, um, fusses about jurisdiction over neighbouring churches, and then interspersed into the chronicle, there is this staggeringly elegant, well-informed, carefully reasoned, um, proper history, real history, the best history, the, certainly the best English history, unfortunately very compressed, of the end of the reign of Edward IV, the reign of Richard, the usurpation and reign of Richard III, and the beginning of the reign of Henry VII, with particularly striking, uh, in, in my view, the condemnation of Henry VII in assuming, uh, in claiming, though not enforcing, the rights of conquest, in um, uh, refusing to... Uh, 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 to begin marrying, uh, to begin by marrying Elizabeth of York, uh, and therefore preserving a dynastic continuity, so much determined to claim the crown in his own right and purely in his own person. And it's a very, it's a very, I mean, it's the it's the account certainly of the um, the end of Richard's reign and the beginning of Henry the Seventh's reign that I think is by far uh, the most interesting, the most important, and forces one to rethink right from the beginning. Um, what Henry VII was trying to do and what his models um, of, of kingship were and they show right at the beginning that he was aiming for what of course the whole reign comes full circle round to something much more like the absolutist style of the French monarchy I think it's after all, he'd been brought up in France and Brittany. That was the sort of kingship that he was used to, and that was how he understood things, and he didn't really understand at that stage England at all, and had had no adult experience of it whatever. So again, the that lovely juxtaposition there uh, in the con continuation of the Croyland Chronicle of the chronicle type on the one hand, a rather bad example of it, and a sensationally good example of history. Hello and thank you for watching David Starkey Talks. If, as I very much hope, you're enjoying them, why not become more actively involved and join my Members Club? As a member, you'll be able to take part in the members only weekly question and answer session, suggest topics for forthcoming videos and have priority booking for my forthcoming live events. And while you're at it, why not have a look at the store page on my website davidstarkey.com. There you can purchase t-shirts and other merchandise, buy signed copies of my books and, if you're feeling brave and a bit flush, even arrange to take me out to lunch. Thank you once again for watching. I look forward to hearing from you and to welcoming you to my Members Club.